Okay, if you look here, we're at lesson two. And when we get done with this one tonight, this will more or less complete the framework we talked about last week, okay, to work around. So we worked on dispensations last week, uh, seven dispensations. And this week, we're going to work on covenants. Now, a covenant, okay, that's an older term, but it means, be, means basically a contract, okay? And uh, lots of us have had to sign on a contract from one time or another, okay? We're selling of a house, okay, buying a house, maybe a car, maybe a certain job that needed to be done, okay? There are certain provisions in a contract in which the parties have to meet certain uh, requirements. And if they don't, okay, the contract's been broken and that's not a good time, okay? And so what we're going to see here today is God's covenant promises, okay? And so this word covenant, you might just want to mark up there as the same thing as a contract, okay? That's just a, an older English word there. And so we're going to see here God's, that's a possessive there. So it's his, his covenant promises to man, mankind generally, the human race, and later to Israel, which is very, very important. It's one of the reasons why we're studying these things, because when we get into the various pro, uh, prophetic lessons here in the next uh, six weeks, we'll see how these deal with basically with the nation of Israel and certain countries and, and, and so forth, and to the, uh, the church, the New Testament church also, and, uh, and how these, those pertain to these things that we see happening today, and the promise of the Messiah. The Messiah, of course, is the Hebrew word for Christ, the Anointed One, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so that's what we're going to be studying about. And so there's eight of them here, and we're going to go through. As time allows us here tonight, I think we can get through these tonight. And I'll try to slow down a little bit here, okay, so that but we'll go through these, and I'll try to make sure you get back there. If you don't get every word down, I mean, it's not the... If you get the main things down, that's the important thing here. And you go back and review those or compare with your husband or your wife or your friend or your whoever may be sitting next to you. You know what did they get on that. But anyway, number one, Roman numeral number one. I use real Roman numerals, okay? So that, <laughs> this is really Roman numeral number one, okay? And this is, talk, we're going to talk about the Edenic Covenant in the Garden of Eden, of course. That's where that's at. The Adini Covenant in the Garden of Eden. And so as you fill that in. And we're going to see here there's a various provisions here. And had uh, God had a covenant, okay, with uh, the inhabitants of Eden. Adam and Eve, okay, the first of the human race. And in this covenant relationship here, he had it placed here that the uh, the responsibility of man was to fill the earth. That's what you might want to put down there for A. Man's responsibility was to fill the earth. And for B, man's responsibility was to subdue the earth. It was to subdue the earth. And Adam was going to be in charge here. Okay, to the human uses. Whatever God's plan was, we don't... We see that it didn't last very long, okay? It, there's only about two or three chapters that deals with this, and then uh, everything changes after that. But anyway, we see here, this is to subdue the earth to human uses for C. We do know that Adam was to have dominion, okay? Dominion over the animals and the rest of creation, okay? But basically the animals, the other living things there on the earth at that time that uh, took place as was created by God in that uh, six days. And that D, he was to eat of the herbs and fruits. They were to be vegans. You know any vegans? I've known a few, okay? And so there was no steaks at that time, that's uh, okay. There was no hamburgers, all right? No hot dogs, okay? It was all vegan, okay? It was the herbs and the fruits of the earth at that time. That will change later on. But here in Eden, it was to be the herbs, okay, and the fruits. And then uh, for E, you could put down, he was to till and keep the garden. He was to till and to keep the garden. So this was going to be an agrarian situation, okay, in the beginning, okay? An agrarian situation. 
and he was to abstain, F there, he was to abstain from eating of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So you can fill those in. Adam and Eve were to abstain from eating of the tree of knowledge and of good and evil. And for G, you can fill this in, I'm sure. The penalty would be what? Death. Death. Okay. Now, as we know, the devil came along, didn't he? With the serpent and said, oh, you won't surely die. Okay, that was a prophecy, wasn't it? <laughs> it was a false one right from the beginning, wasn't it? All right. God had told, that was a prophecy also, told Adam and Eve that if they ate of it, they'd surely die that day. And he was 100% right on that one, wasn't he? Okay, and the devil was, was batting zero, wasn't he? Okay. <laughs> but he knew he was going to be batting zero. That was the, that was the thing. But anyway, but the penalty, of course, was death. And so that was the situation with the Dini covenant. And Adam and Eve broke that covenant. And therefore, that was ended. Okay, so the, that, that's, the, takes, that's done away with there, right? Very, very early in the Bible there, in the first few chapters of Genesis. Okay? Number two, Roman numeral number two. The next one is the Adamic Covenant. A-D-A-M-I-C. Adamic Covenant with, with Adam. The Adamic Covenant. And this deals with the life of fallen man. The life of fallen man, that man had fell into sin. He had fallen away from the, the perfectness of the Garden of Eden. He was thrust out of the Garden of Eden. And so God does make a covenant, though, with him. And A, the serpent, okay, is cursed. The serpent is cursed. Remember, he used to crawl there, and of course, Satan's received the, that same curse there. He was Satan's tool, he was cursed. And we see that later on throughout the Bible, that uh, there in the Exodus, okay, the brazen serpent, okay, and how that uh, they were, they, that was the picture there when they were bitten by the snakes, if you remember there in the uh, wilderness, and they had to look and live, they had to look at the brazen serpent, and the Lord Jesus became that for us, we're to look and live, okay, that was a type, that was a model. Okay, for what was going to happen later. But the serpent is cursed. And for B there, we have the promise of a Savior or a Redeemer. You can put either one down. And that was in Genesis 3.15. We saw that last week. So you should, as we go through these, you're going to see how that the covenants and the dispensations kind of run parallel with one another and come in there and complement one another as we go through. But as in Genesis 3.15, if you want to look back there, but we looked at that last week there, that, that the, uh, the serpent's head, okay, was to be bruised, was to be crushed, and the heel of the Messiah, okay, the Redeemer, was to be uh, bruised. But it's uh, the promise of the Redeemer. He is the promised seed, the, 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 uh, the descendant of the woman, okay, that would come along eventually. But that was the promise. And that was uh, this situation here when this covenant was made. What would seal the covenant? How do we know it was going to be genuine? It would be sealed with what? A blood, wasn't it? In case sacrificing the, the animals that God had uh, killed there to provide for the clothing for Adam and Eve at that time, as this Adamic covenant okay, is brought forth, that was a blood offering. Okay? So blood is shed to show that uh, this was uh, the God's going to consider it to be done, and so that was the seed. And so after this, we see here then the seed. Then Abel came along. Okay, but Abel was murdered, wasn't he? By Cain, the devil already was trying to to uh, throw a monkey wrench into that whole redemption process, didn't he? And so he was quick to work on that, and so he had Abel murdered by his brother. But God provided an alternative, didn't he? And the alternative then was Seth. So you can put that in your little blank after that. After Seth was Noah. Okay, as we go through the lineage there. And then Shem. And next would be, before, Abra uh, before Isaac was, Abraham, wasn't there? Abraham, 
and then Isaac, and then Jacob, then Judah. Talk more about these people later on. After Judah, you had David, King David. We'll say more about that tonight. And then the promised seed would be Emmanuel, God with us, the Lord Jesus Christ, foretold in Isaiah chapter 7, verses 9 through 14. Okay, the virgin birth. We'll look at that one of these days here. But anyway, for time's sake tonight, you should just remember, you can look at yourself there, you'll see the promise of Emmanuel. See, the woman is under the headship of man. Okay, and that was one of the things that came out of this Adamic covenant here, that man was to be the head of the household. Okay, man was to be the head over the woman, and the woman was under the headship of man. D, the earth was cursed. The earth was cursed. We see these curses every once in a while, especially this time of the year, don't we? We plant a garden. It doesn't take too long to see the weeds, right? <laughs> the thistles, the dandelions. Wow, they just go wild, don't they? Huh? They look pretty in the beginning, but then it's, uh, it can be a real mess, isn't it? Okay. But you take, that's all part of the curse. The earth is cursed. We see here the sorrow of life on a day-to-day -day basis. Human beings have this sorrow of life that goes on here because of sin. For F... If they had stayed in Eden, if they had been allowed to stay in Eden, if they had not broken the covenant, the contract, they would have had a light occupation as they would have ministered and tilling and taking care of the garden. But since they broke it, it becomes a burdensome labor or hard labor, sweat. And G, the final result is physical death. death, right? So you can see how all these fall along, parallel, what we studied about last week. Okay, so that, that Adamic covenant is still going on, isn't it? It's still in effect today. All right. Now next year, number three, is the Noahic covenant. We studied a little bit about that last week. Okay, the Noahic Covenant. And that's in Genesis chapter 9, verses 1 through 6. And this brings about human government. Okay, before that, people lived by their conscience, didn't they? What's right and wrong? How'd that work out? <laughs> didn't work out too well, did it? Only eight people were saved as the flood comes. Just a matter of a number of a few hundred years later. Okay, they're in the Genesis 6 through 7. And when the eight are let out of the ark, okay, well then we have human government gets started. It's put within man all over the world. Okay, there's some that do a better job than others, aren't they? Okay, some of these tribes that are very, very primitive. And then there's others, you know, as we study throughout history, whether it was Babylon or whether it was Egypt or whatever it might be, were very, very sophisticated. Or the Romans, okay, and their government. So, but that was all, came out part of the Noe Covenant human government. And so you might want to put down here for A, this is the relation of man to the earth is confirmed. Okay, well, that's, man's going to have to live by the sweat of his brow. It's going to be a burdensome work. And he's going to have to, uh, but he is going to be under human government. Okay, there is uh, punishments for wrongdoing. Okay, the taking of blood for, you know, the life of, uh, for murder, okay, and things of that sort. So the relation of man to the earth is confirmed. For B, the order of nature is confirmed. Man is at the top, and then the animal kingdom, and so forth. So the order is confirmed. So they're, basically, the Noahic Covenant does uh, confirm some of the things that's in the Adamic Covenant. Then you can see there human government we've mentioned before. So I just went ahead and filled that in. And then D, there's a rainbow. Not like you see today some of the things out there in the woke world, right? Okay. But there was the rainbow that God gave because there would be what? No more flood. 
no flood. <laughs> okay? So you can just put down there, no more or no flood or no future flood by water. And he confirms then again the, messi the messianic line okay, would be through Noah's son Shem. Okay, of course it was Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Okay, but the messianic line would be through Shem. Next year, okay, at number four, is the Abrahamic covenant. And let's take our Bibles and turn to Genesis 15. I think we may have touched on this last week. Genesis 15, verse 18. It says, In the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt, unto the great river, the river Euphrates. And then in, move over, we'll move back a few pages there to Genesis chapter 12 and verses 1 to 4. Great promise there. Where it says, Now the Lord had said, verse 1, unto Abram, Get, thy, get thee out of the, thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's home unto a land that I will show thee, and I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing, and I will bless him that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. So Abram departed, as the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him, his nephew there, and Abram was seventy and five years old when he departed out of Haran. So anyway, this is a long time. He was not a young man, although they lived longer back in those days, didn't they? But nonetheless, he was 75 years old when he gets this call from God to leave Ur of the Chaldees and, and go to a new home. I moved a couple years ago. It was 74. I don't care to move again. <laughs> that's, that's not that. Lots of people, some people may move a lot of times, okay? And so lived in one house for 30 years, and I had to decide to... To move, I said, oh, this is going to be the last time I do this. Again, not going to be, hopefully it's not going to happen again with another within 30 years. But uh, so anyway. But nonetheless here, you might want to put down in uh, for A here that he was going to be given here. He was going to be made a great nation. God promises. You're, now, he didn't have any children at this time. He and Sarah didn't have any children. Age 75, and she is what, about 65, I guess about 10 years difference. And they didn't have any children yet. And yet he says, I'm going to make a great nation out of you in the land of Canaan. In the land of Canaan. Over there in the Middle East, where Israel's at today, where Gaza is at today, where Lebanon, okay, Jordan, so forth. And so we see a great nation in the land of Canaan. And then we see here there's going to be here a, for number one, you might want to put down here, a natural descendants or natural posterity. Okay, physically he's talking about here. He's going to have <laughs> Isaac and the grandson Jacob and so forth are going to be born and raised in this land. And so it's going to be a natural, I misspelled that, okay, you need to put an R in there, okay? So anyway, a natural posterity. And then a, there's also going to be a spiritual posterity. This also had a spiritual tint to it here, a spiritual element. And that was, the reason was what? By what? By faith, wasn't it? Abraham believed God and was counted to him for righteousness. Genesis 15, verse 6. Okay, so a, there's a physical realm of it as far as descendants are concerned. And then it was also a spiritual, and because they believed in the promises of God. Abraham here believes in the promises of God. And 
God makes a covenant with him. And you just might want to put down here for number four, this was also carried on with Isaac. And even who else? Jacob. Huh? Jacob. Later on, but before that. Oh, hmm? Ishmael? Yes, Ishmael. Very good. Okay. Ishmael. I mean, he was not to be the favorite one. He was not to be part of the messianic line, but still Ishmael was a given, to, said he was going to be a great nation. If you want to put a, a couple of verses down, it's in Genesis chapter 17 and verses 18 to 20. So if you want to look that up, you know, you can. But that was, uh, he did promise that to Ishmael. And that that's, prophecy's been true, isn't it? Okay. Yeah. They've been adversaries. Most of them have been to the Jewish people over all these centuries. Mm -hmm. And yet, they've become a, a great nation. Okay, many nations, actually. And so you need to put down here for B, okay, they're blessed. Abraham was blessed physically and spiritually. Abraham was blessed physically and spiritually. All part of this Abrahamic covenant. And see, his name would be great. His name would be great. D, that he was going to be a blessing. He was going to be a blessing to others. He was a good neighbor for the most part. Okay, got along with some of them, some of them he didn't. But we do know this, okay, that according to Genesis chapter 12, verse 3, as we read before, he could be, a, they, all the families of the earth would be blessed and or cursed, <laughs> depending on how they treated Abraham and his descendants, especially through Isaac and then through Jacob and through the patriarchs, okay? How they treated him. We have seen that to be true throughout human history. Okay, so all the flam families of the earth would be blessed, okay, that blessed Abraham. And you need to put down here, he was, of course, he was going to be a blessing. And all the families would be blessed. And you might want to put down here uh, an F on this if you don't have it, okay? This was an unconditional covenant. What do we mean by unconditional? Hmm? One what? One-sided One to a certain extent, okay. It means that the man himself didn't have to really do anything. It's just that God said he was going to, he did this with, remember they, he put Abraham asleep and God divided up the animals there and, uh, and went through the, uh, by fire through them and, and sealed that covenant, didn't he? And Abraham wakes up and, hey, I made a great deal here. <laughs> I've been blessed here physically. I'm going to be anyway and spiritually. And so all this was done. Okay. And so his name was made great. And he was to be a blessing to others. And he was to be blessed. And this was unconditional. That means this was, could not be broken by man's disobedience. But God would fulfill it. And that's important. Okay, as we'll see later on here. Number five, going right along here. Next, we're going to deal with the Mosaic Covenant. We covered that last week in the Mosaic dis uh, Dispensation there, the law. Don't spend too much time on that. But anyway, it was to Israel. That was not to any other nation. Okay, that was the covenant. That was the contract that God made there in the Ten Commandments, wasn't it? Okay, they're in the Exodus. They're in the Sinai Peninsula. And so you can put down here Exodus 19.25. That's where that is one of the references to it. But A, it was to Israel. And for B, you can put down is the commandments of God. Commandments of God there, the judgments. You can break these down. The commandments are the righteous will of God. The judgments are uh, the very uh, the, uh, the spiritual life there. Ordinances, the religious life. I don't care if you get all that down. 
but for part B, condemnation. Condemnation and death. This is reiterated, Paul reiterates that in 2 Corinthians, if you want it in, uh, 3 verses 7 through 9, for time's sake, but uh, anyway. See, this was conditional. This was not unconditional. This was conditional. The works of the law. If you did the works of the law, you weren't saved by them, but you were blessed by them, weren't you? Okay, you were in fellowship with God. If you did all those animal sacrifices and had all those holidays and did all these different things to the minutest detail, you were going to be blessed. If you didn't, you kind of have a hard time of it, all right? So anyway, we see here this was a, uh, the works of the law here was conditional. You had to do those certain things. Now the next one here, we're going to spend a little bit of time on, this number six, because this is one that's uh, very important for us here. In about the last seven to eight months, if you look at the news each night, okay, or during the day, if you're a political junkie like some of us might be around here, okay, catching up on those things. But number six you need to put down here is the Palestinian Covenant, okay? P-A-L-E-S-T-I-N-I-A-N. I saw one of those places on the, one of the campuses there. They misspelled Palestinian on this step. Did you see that on the news the other day there? <laughs> Here they were demonstrating for the Palestinian. Didn't even know how to spell Palestinian. I thought my generation of college was a little smarter than that, but anyway. <laughs> But the Palestinian Covenant, and I want you to, let's go over to Deuteronomy, okay, that's back there in the Old Testament, the fifth book that Moses wrote, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 30, and verse 3, actually verses 1 through 10, if you have a Schofield, it talks about a sixth the Palestinian covenant here. It shall come to pass when all these things are come upon thee, the blessing and the curse which I have set before thee, and thou shalt call them to mine among all the nations whither the Lord thy God hath driven thee, and shalt return unto the Lord thy God, and shalt obey his voice according to all that I command thee this day, thou and thy children with all thine heart and with all thy soul, that then the Lord thy God will turn thy captivity. That means to bring you back and have compassion upon thee and will return and gather thee from all the nations where the Lord thy God has scattered thee. So we're going to be talking about that a lot here in the next few weeks. But anyway, the Palestinian covenant here, okay, it is, you need to put it down, it's to Israel. This is not, this comes with nobody else. And it's dispersion for disobedience. Dispersion means you're kicked out of the land. Now that did not mean that God was going to give that land to somebody else as far as possession is concerned. Okay, the, the uh, ownership, okay, was still with, be with the nation of Israel. But it did mean that God was not going to allow them to live in this promised land because of their disobedience. So they were going to be dispersed or scattered, you might want to put down, into the Gentile nations for their disobedience. And we'll talk more about that later. But he's saying here in part B that there, when we saw here, there would be a future repentance if the Israelites would repent of their sins. If they would repent when they were in dispersion, like in Babylon, or in Media Persia, or whatever, or none in the Grecian Empire, they could return, future repentance in dispersion, and see they could return of the, uh, of the Lord, which is promised in verse 3, and he would return. 
And that's also in the, the book of, let's take our Bibles and turn to Amos. Way far there, go to Daniel. And then there's Hosea. And after that, Amos. After Joel, okay. After Hosea, then Joe, then Amos. The Old Testament prophet. Chapter 9. And verses 9 through 14. He says in verse 9, For lo, I com will command, and I will sift the house of Israel among the nation, all nations. He's talking about them in dispersion. Like as corn is, get, is sifted in a, sleet, in a sieve, it shall not the least grain fall upon the earth. All the sinners of my people shall die by the sword, which say, The evil shall not overtake nor prevent us. In that day will I raise up the tabernacle of David that has fallen. Okay, talking about the temple. And close up the breaches thereof, and I will raise up his, his ruins, and I will build it in the days of old, that they may possess the remnant of Edom, and all the heathen which are called by my name, saith the Lord, that doeth this. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that the plowman shall overtake the reaper, and the treader of grapes, him that sow a seed, and thou shalt drop sweet wine, and the hills shall melt. Talking about the thousand-year reign. And I will bring again the captivity of my people of Israel, and they shall build the waste cities and inhabit them, and they shall plant vineyards and drink the wine thereof. They shall also make uh, gardens and eat the fruit thereof, and I will plant them upon their land, and they shall no more be pulled up out of their land, which I have given them, saith the Lord thy God. That's a great promise, conf confirmation of that, isn't it? Okay? And so that's why today, when people are saying from the river to the sea, <laughs> Wipe the nation of Israel off from the river to the sea. It's not going to happen. <laughs> it's not going to happen. Okay, God's given his promise. Now, there are certain, even certain Christian groups, okay, and some of those we've talked about last week there, like the ones that believe in all millennialism, no millennialism, no millennial, no millennium, no thousand year reign. A lot of Protestant groups, Catholic groups and that. And they say that because Israel rejected their Messiah, God has rejected them. And the promises that God made to them, God's not going to keep those promises. He's going to give it to the church, whatever. Their ideas. But that is not biblical. Okay? And Paul brings that out in the book of Romans. We don't have time to go there tonight, but he deals with that and tells about how that God has not forsaken his people of Israel. And so that's one of the things that the, we as premillennialists okay, understand. Okay? That God has not forsaken the nation of Israel. And therefore, okay, there will be, as we see here, a, D, a restoration to the land. A restoration to the land. This is in Isaiah chapter 11. You might want to turn over to Isaiah, the prophet there. Go past Psalms and Ecclesiastes and Isaiah chapter 11 and verses 11 and 12. For Isaiah says, And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time. Twice. Okay, we'll see how that works out. I'm not going to tell you right now. Okay, that's a later lesson here pretty soon. Okay, to recover the remnant of the people which shall be left from Assyria and from Egypt and so forth. Okay, so he's talking about they will be brought back from the four corners of the earth down here in verse 12. Okay, and back to the land. So he's talking about a restoration to the land. This is also in Jeremiah. You might want to look down there, 23, verses 3 through 8. That can be a good study for you this week. Also in the book of Ezekiel, 37, verses 21 to 25. So there's various places in the Old Testament prophets that God promises that he's going to bring the people of Israel, after they've been taken out of the land, and we're going to study more about that next week, that they'll be brought back. And either will be a national conversion, a national conversion. This is also doing, you can see that in Ezekiel 37, I guess that's basically where that should be. Romans chapter 11, verses 26 to 27, where Paul deals with that. 
and Hosea chapter two. In fact, let's just look there. Look onto the book of Hosea. Go past Daniel. Chapter two and verses fourteen to sixteen. He says, Therefore, behold, I will allure her and bring her into the wilderness and speak comfortably unto her, and I will give her, her vineyards from thence and the valley of Achor for a door of hope. And she shall sing there as in the days of her youth, as in the day when she came up out of the land of Egypt. And it shall be on that day, saith the Lord, that thou shalt call me Ishtai, okay, which means my husband, and thou shalt call me no more Balai. Okay, so anyway, that's talking about H here, my Lord. Okay, with a little L. Okay, so that's another promise here. F, F here, judgment of the oppressors. Judgment of the enemies. And we'll be studying about that, so we'll get back to these verses. But Isaiah chapter 14, verses 1 to 2, Joel 3, 1 through 8, Matthew 25, verses 31 to 41. You can look those up, but it's basically talking about the great tribulation period, okay, and the end of the tribulation period. And we'll study more about that. But the judgment will come upon the oppressors, the oppressors or the enemies. And for G, a national, a national prosperity. And we already turned to these places here in Deuteronomy chapter 30 and Amos chapter 9. And so they'll be brought back into the place of blessing under God. Now it'll be take place during the millennium, okay, the thousand year reign of Christ. So that's the Palestinian covenant. So I wanted to spend a little more time on that because all the things we see going on here today revolves around that promise. Is God going to keep that promise? If he's not, they may have a, a bone of contention there, right? But if God does, says he's going to fulfill that, it's vain and empty what they're trying to get accomplished. It's not going to happen. And so you can count on that. <laughs> I remember, uh, we'll talk maybe about that someday again, but I remember during this uh, the Yom Kippur War in 1973, it's hard to believe it's been over 50 years, but I was in the Air Force at that time, and the Southern Baptist chaplain, he was an all-millennial. I think I told you about that. And, and I remember the, the, uh, the, the Egyptians and the Syrians attacked, and Israel looked like they were on the ropes there, and he told me one day, he said, I don't think Israel's going to make it. And I lifted up that Bible, and I said, well, if this book is true, Israel's going to make it. <laughs> And so that was right, okay? Okay, so anyway, we see here this pr national prosperity is gonna take place. And so all of these things we see going on today are, were circles right around this Palestinian covenant. Now we got two more covenants here, so we got a few more minutes here. Number seven, the Davidic covenant. The Davidic covenant, this is in 2 Samuel 7, verse 16, and Psalm 89. Hey, that's, I put that down here for A, 2 Samuel, chapter 7, verses 8 through 17. And this is where God promises that David, King David, he would be king, and he'd always have a descendant to be on the throne of Israel. And so that's the Davidic covenant, the Davidic house, his family. He would always have a descendant that have a rightful place on the throne. And how did he, who did he inspire to show that to be true? Hmm? Matthew, didn't he? Matthew chapter one. How many times have you ever read the first chapter of Matthew? Or you just skipped over that. <laughs> All those names, okay? But he showed through his lineage there. The Lord Jesus Christ has a legal right to that throne through his uh, stepfather, Joseph, okay? And, but even in Luke chapter three, it shows Mary's lineage, and so he even has a natural line too, okay? Back to King David. And so David here, the David household, okay? The David throne, and that's, uh, you might wanna put down here, that's, uh, take your Bibles and turn here to, and you know, the throne there, the, 
the royal authority, Psalm 110. Turn back to Psalm 110. That's just a short one, but it's a great one. a few verses there, but it says, The Lord said unto my Lord. Notice that uh, the Lord there is all capitals, and then unto the Lord with a capital L, that's Jehovah, and to Adonai, which means master. Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. The Lord Jesus referred to this prophecy. He said it refers to him. Okay, there in the Gospels. And so the Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion. Rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power. In the beauty of holiness from the womb of the morning, thou hast the dew of thy youth. And so forth. And so if you read on through there, okay, you can see that this is the promise that God makes okay, to David and to the Messiah himself. Okay, that his kingdom is going to be there. This is also in Psalm 89. If you want to look there, okay, in verses 30 and 37, talks about the promise to King David that he would always have an heir to the throne, his throne, in Jerusalem. And for part E there, you can put down, this would be perpetuity forever. And it is not conditional. <laughs> it is not conditional. Just because if David had sinned or Solomon had sinned or Rehoboam or whatever, didn't mean that that Davidic line to the Messiah was going to be cut off. It just meant they might not be able to live in the land. That's for sure. There'd be a dispersion. But that promise was going to be fulfilled. Okay, that David would have a seed, would have a descendant that would be the Messiah. And that we know that to be true and to be fulfilled, don't we? Okay, that Davidic covenant is in force today. And so those people over there are trying to take over that land, take over Jerusalem, all that. They're saying, Jesus, you're not going to reign here. That's what they're saying. I think that's going to go over <laughs> in the throne room of, of heaven. Not quite, is it? Okay. God has a veto power over that. All right. And so what we see here, okay, is that this goes on forever. It's not conditional. Okay, it will not be broken. And then the last one here is we have five minutes left here, the New Covenant. Okay, Hebrews 8. We're going to look at these two portions here. There's many more, though. But take your Bibles and turn to Hebrew 8. Hebrews 8. I believe the Apostle Paul wrote this, but there's others that believe that that's uh, maybe not the case. Find out someday. There's some things in the Bible we just can't say for certain in there. Okay. These are not heaven or hell issues, by the way. <laughs> are they? Okay. We can have a different opinion about some things. But in Hebrews 8, verse 8, that's an easy one to remember there. He says, For finding fault with them, he said, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant, or a new testament, with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand and lead them out of the land of Egypt. Talking about the Mosaic one there. Okay. Also, you might want to go back to Matthew chapter 26. Matthew 26. Very familiar portion of scripture here in the gospel. Matthew 26, verse, uh, uh, verse I'm sorry. No, it's Matthew 20. Okay, isn't it? No, it's Matthew 26, isn't it? Okay. Matthew 26 and verse 28. Yeah, for the Lord Jesus in the Last Supper, he says, For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. That word testament and covenant are synonymous here. Okay, so he's talking about the Lord Jesus is saying that the New Testament, the new covenant that's been promised in Old Testament times. Take your Bibles and turn back to Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 31. In verses 34, or 30, Jeremiah 31, verse 31.
Jeremiah says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant I made with their fathers. See, the Lord Jesus is reiterating. Okay, from the book of Jeremiah. In that day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they should break, although I was a husband unto them, saith the Lord. And he goes on. Okay. And then also, Jeremiah chapter 24. Okay, he does that also. If you turn back there a few pages, 24, verse 7. That's an interesting chapter. We'll maybe take more time on that one of these days here. But he says, And I will give them in heart to know me that I am the Lord, that they shall be my people, and I shall be their God, for they shall return unto me with their whole heart. Talking about the time that the nation of Israel accepts the Lord Jesus Christ as their Messiah. And for as we finish up here in part B, this was better than the Mosaic Covenant. This is better than the law. What Paul brings out, or Hebrews brings out here. Part C, these are unconditional promises. Unconditional. Their being fulfilled does not depend upon our obedience. Okay? The Lord will perform what he says he's going to do. All right? And from the mosaic, which was fear, to a willing heart by the power of the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost. So you had to obey, obey God out of fear in the Old Testament time. But when you're born again, if you're truly born again by the Spirit of God, you have a willing heart to do those things, don't you? Do those we fail oftentimes, don't we? Every day, okay? But at least if it's genuine in your life, that's what you're, you want to do. If you don't, there's something wrong there, okay? But this is out of a willing heart by the power of the Holy Spirit. And for E here, it's a complete oblivion of sins. The New Testament, the Lord Jesus Christ, it's not like those animal sacrifices before and those other ones where they were just temporary, just rolled them over from year to year. That means your sins from past, today, and the future are all paid for, for the whole human race. So there's a complete oblivion of sins. And we have an accomplished redemption in Christ forever. An accomplished redemption in Christ forever. Through his death, burial, and resurrection. And it's all received by faith, isn't it? Okay. So those are your eight covenants. And we're going to see in the weeks to come. Make sure if, when you come next week, make sure you don't bring just a New Testament, bring an Old Testament, okay? Because we're going to get into the book of Daniel. We're going to talk about dispersions in the book of Daniel and that and get into the real meat where it should have the puzzle framework complete now. And that will fill in the major pillars of the prophetic promises that God makes and how he's going to do it in the next, next six weeks, okay? Any questions? <laughs> okay. Okay, thank you for your uh, attention to that. Let's bow for prayer and we'll be dismissed tonight.